Thank you, Mike. Um, yeah, I'd just like to share some thoughts, really, on um, an alternative method of goal determination, uh, other than spectroscopy, uh, which happens to be an ongoing project for us at the ASS office at the moment. Um, tomorrow you're going to hear a lot more about um, the ICP method of by difference by the ISO Technical Committee, uh, for difference for, for gold alloys, um, possible extensions to scope to four nines gold, uh, which can also be used to determine trace levels of PGMs as well as other elements. So, so far assay, generally regarded as the most accurate method of analysis for gold uh, within an alloy, but there are limitations um, when PGMs are present in the original sample. So we might see large variations in the PGM content depending on the origin of the material. However, we can still use fire assay as an alternative method um, of analysis for gold alloys when the samples contain a higher than trace amounts of PGMs, i.e. platinum, palladium, rhodium, ruthenium, iridium, and occasionally osmium, but it's really seen. Uh, we generally, obviously being our surface, we're generally involved in jewellery alloys mainly, so we don't really see that at all. The accuracy of the gold content, though, or the gold determination, is largely dependent on the level of the PGMs in the sample. Anything above around about 0.1% rhodium, ruthenium, or iridium uh, is problematic for the fire assay process, whereas higher levels of platinum, uh, approximately 10%, and up to 25% palladium content can be corrected for. Also, the presence of more than one of these elements is presents complications uh, to the fire assay process, but generally in most, most scenarios we don't see, we only see one element as the main inclusion in any significant amount. So, why would, you, why would samples contain any PGMs? Well, refined gold can originate from several different sources, deep mines, alluvial deposits, scrap jewellery, uh, electronic scrap will contain elements, other elements, uh, such as silver, copper, lead, zinc, iron, nickel, as well as your PGMs. Scrap jewellery certainly contains, will contain relatively high amounts of PGMs like palladium in some white golds and rhodium probably from plating layers. There may, may also be small amounts of platinum, rhodium or ruthenium um, from, likely to be from grain refiners. Although these are small amounts, um, they could build up over time, in certainly in recycled scrap material, uh, and may well present, may well still be present at trace levels in high-grade gold greater than 995. ISO 11426 describes a method of analysis for gold content in simple matrices such as gold, silver, copper, zinc alloys, with modifications for nickel, palladium, and high silver content. A high degree of accuracy, less than one part per thousand uh, by mass, as specified by the standard, can be achieved with these alloy types. Assuming, of course, that closely matched um, matrix match proofs are run in parallel. But the base of fire assay is the removal of the base metals by an oxidation process. Uh, so if any PGMs are present, uh, they do not oxidize at the, at the higher temperatures and are also resistant to nitric acid in the parting process. Even small amounts can compromise the accuracy of the true gold content, and they are retained to some extent in the final gold cornet. This means that obviously that the final calculated gold figure could be biased on the high side. In order to initially determine whether or, whether or not the gold alloy contains any PGMs, most of us can use XRF analysis to screen the original sample for semi-quantitative elemental composition. And this will give us a good indication of whether or not fire assay is going to be suitable as a method of analysis for a particular sample. A trained eye can identify PGMs in the fire assay process quite well. For example, we can get an indication of PGMs in the sample by the appearance of the bead after cupellation and also the gold cornet at the end of the process. For example, obviously some of you may be very familiar with, these, with these, these types of images, others may not so. Essentially, 
platinum and palladium at quite high amounts. The, the platinum beads on the, on the left there, frosted appearance, um, higher the platinum content, the flatter the bead and the duller and grey it will be in colour. Palladium, very similar to platinum, except that more palladium content can be present before the indications are, are noticeable. Iridium, difficult to see, but it's slightly soluble in silver and gold at cupellation temperature. So you might be able to see black spots on the bottom of the bead as it sinks to the bottom because it's a, gr it's a greater density, stains the cupel black. You can also see crystal on the left there, you can just about see some crystal boundaries which are visible, even though it looks like a finer texture. Rhodium on the left. Small amounts, easy to see. The bead assumes a bluish grey colour. Ruthenium, black crystalline deposits, particularly on the bottom edge. Cornets after parting. Well, platinum and palladium, no discoloration, but sh very shiny surfaces as opposed to dull or matte effect. Examples of iridium, <coughs> rhodium, excuse me, <coughs> and, and ruthenium. Iridium, distorted surface, raised areas. The cornet edges are uneven, and this is obviously a possible source of error. Rhodium, black, finely, deposit, finely divided deposits spread over the surface of the cornet. And ruthenium, fairly, it's a bit cleaner, but black deposits are collected on the edge, around the edges. These PGMs react differently during the fire assay process. So there are some general observations to note. As well as any gold and silver, practically all the platinum, palladium and iridium will be contained within the final bead, whereas some of the rhodium, ruthenium and osmium will be par partly have been oxidised or, or volatilised. Rhodium, ruthenium, particularly iridium, do not mix with gold and tend to get dispersed as fine particles within the alloy. <clears throat> the presence of any of these metals <coughs> raises the melting point of the, of the alloy, so the method requires high accumulation temperatures, 1100 to 1150 degrees, so to prevent freezing and remove as much of the lead as possible. As we know, copper also remove, aids the removal of the lead and helps prevent the molten silver from absorbing oxygen, so it's important to add sufficient amounts to samples and proofs. If we take the nitric acid part in process, Rhodium, ruthenium and iridium are practically unattacked by nitric acid in any significant amounts. So they tend to be retained in or on the final gold cornet. And as we've seen with some of the previous images, um, it's fairly easy to see these metals deposited uses a black residue, which will be part of the final weight of the cornet. So a quantitative determination of these metals is tricky. As few studies have been really carried out and recovery of the PGM is quite difficult. But one, one approach, but certainly for iridium, is by separation techniques. Um, after the cornet's been weighed, dissolve it in dilute aqua regia to digest the gold, leaving the iridium as an insoluble residue. Filter it, wash it with dilute aqua regia, deionise water, and dilute, finally dilute ammonia. After drying the residue, we can ignite it in a porcelain crucible. The iridium can be weighed and subtracted from the combined weight of the gold iridium cornet. As far as we're concerned, in jewellery alloys, um, a high percentage of the metal that's traded is white gold containing platinum and palladium specifically. We can use different approaches for this. Obviously, ISO 11426, the palladium is well, well documented. It's, it's the easiest for the PGMs to deal with. It's readily soluble in, uh, in an alloy during the, um, as, a, as an alloy during the, the, the parting stage for palladium nitrate. It's clearly defined in the, in, the, in the standard that in order to facilitate the removal of the palladium content, two parting stages should be performed. That is, after the first parting, we re-alloy with the required amount of silver and re and part a second time. It's important to run in parallel uh, to at least two closely matrix match proofs. Uh, and good, good, good repeatability can be attained with quite high palladium contents of up to 25% in gold alloys for example, in 18-carat golds, where we can actually attain total removal of the palladium. Platinum, a little bit more difficult, but essentially, when dealing with amounts of platinum in a sample, we use the addition of fine gold as a preferred approach. 
So this is a method that we use on a relatively routine basis for gold samples containing high platinum and palladium uh, or low gold content even. It's impossible to separate the platinum entirely from the gold in one nitric acid treatment. The gold platinum residue invariably retains silver, uh, which tends to increase the greater the platinum content in the sample. However, the addition of fine gold to decrease proportionately the platinum content within the sample in order to facilitate the total removal of the platinum during the parting stage is the way that we would, we would go. So the methodology speaks for itself essentially. Um, samples, 100 to 120 milligrams. We can use big, larger samples, the platinum content is below 3%. In other words, the higher the platinum content, the lower the sample weight. Fine gold addition, preferably at least four nines gold. In quotation silver, 2.2 times the total weight of gold and platinum. 20 milligrams of copper, 8, eight grams of lead. Proofs. Proofs should be matrix matched with gold and platinum to plus or minus one milligrams of the original XRF figure. Cupellation temperature, 1150 degrees. Parting procedure, 20 minutes in both acids, 90 degrees with the lower surface of the cornet on the outside so that this area is attacked first. And the samples and proofs need to be recupelled with the appropriate amount of silver and copper prior to the second parting stage. So the, cal the calculation. This is the calculation. So we're taking into, we're taking into, uh, into consideration the standard of the fine gold radding. Uh, in most, it, which should be four nines minimum. So the gold, the gold content, you can see there, um, CM, CM1, the mass, the mass of the sample in milligrams. CM2, mass of the, the sample cornet in milligrams. And then the important part, the correction factor, um, FM, milligrams of fine gold, multiplied by the fine gold finest, divided by 1,000. TST, total proof surcharge in milligrams. Total and TMP, the total cornet mass of proofs in milligrams. If we look at an example, this is just one example, which is quite a good one. That's why I picked it, really. But essentially, gold sample containing... 755.03 parts thousand nominally. So the gold alloy contains 5.4% platinum, some silver, some copper, some zinc. And we run with it at least two proofs, twice through the parting process. So we, we get two proofs exhibiting losses. You can see there 0.191 milligrams and 0.101 milligrams after a second parting procedure. If we, feed, if we feed the figures in into the, the, the equation, you can see the result 755.09 gold parts per thousand, essentially. So there's a, there's a slight retention there. Is that, what is that retention? Is it platinum? Well, if it's platinum, then the retention is 60 ppm, which for most, for most assay labs, as far as we're concerned, would be perfectly okay. That, that wouldn't present a problem to us at all. So what you see here is that this is a table of, it's, admittedly, it's, it's very few samples. It's only, it's only five, ten samples in total because it's, an on, it's still an ongoing project. So essentially, it gives us an idea, really, of what, how much platinum palladium is retained in the cornets, essentially. Um, the data shows the total removal of any palladium content, as you can see. If we take quite high amounts of um, platinum, 10%, palladium, 12%, and palladium, 25%, after one parting, you can see we see the, the PPM of those particular elements left in the cornet after the first parting. Then we put it through the second, pro second parting process. Even at 25% palladium content, we get total removal of that palladium, or at least less than one PPM anyway. Platinum, obviously, slightly harder, but essentially, on average, we're looking at no more than about 100 PPM after two partings, which again, for our application, would be fine, and I guess for, for quite a few people as well. So, whilst the PGMs uh, are problematic, 
sort of goal determination and say this is, a, this is an alternative method, and we probably all use spectroscopy, I guess, but in most cases, if it's a problem. But they are problematic for goal determination in fire assay, but we can use it as an alternative. And these processes are simple enough for any technician to understand, as long as each individual car carries out their own validation, uh, and they should be able to produce fairly reliable results. And that's it. Thank you very much.